Well, it's the good and the bad of getting to go first. It's great to set the stage, but whoop, up here cold, so, and it is cold. It's cold. Yeah. So, my name is Victoria Hussey. I am from Port Huron Northern. And, you know, the first question that was on the list for us is, you know, why, why do you want to teach an online class? And for me, it was like, well, why not? I've, I've always liked technology. It sounded like it would be interesting, and so I kind of jumped into it. And I feel like I have a lot to say, like way more than 10 minutes worth. So as I go through all this, keep in mind that the end, at the end, there's a nice little slide with all my information on it. So as I mumble through things or if I cruise through something that you really wanted to know more about, just wait for that slide and you can write it down and you can snag me later. That way I won't feel so bad as I try and cram all of the stuff that I want to say into just 10 minutes. So, I put this up here because I was thinking about, well, what is it that I like about technology? And it isn't any one thing. There's a lot of different things that led me to this. And I put this up here because I wanted you to have an idea of my background and that I, I love taking classes. It's almost like a hobby. And I've ended up in, I think, just about every kind of online class you can have. I've had completely online classes. I've done blended learning where I go on campus for a couple of weeks and then <clears throat> go back and finish it online. And then hybrid where you're a little bit of both. I've taken online classes at all the ones listed up there. And then down at the bottom, I put in there Masters of Educational Technology from MSU. I have to give them a little shout out and say that they have a wonderful technology program that's geared for educators and they really let you customize it. So even though I'm an art teacher, it's still really helpful for me. So a little bit of my background for you. The class that I'm teaching is completely online. It is grades 10 through 12. It's a one-to-one -one program, meaning that each student is assigned a laptop. There were, and that sounds wonderful, and it's wonderful now, but I will say that there were a lot of hurdles to getting that set up. Because it is digital design and involves Photoshop and Illustrator, those of you who've ever used those programs or even looked at them realize they are enormously expensive, and it's a real dilemma of how to get that software to them if they're going to be online. And so our best solution after trying multiple ones was to get the software that we use in the building for the regular face-to-face -face version of this class and put it on a laptop which they check out for the duration of the class. It is an interesting way to do this class because I do have the face-to-face -face version and they're a little bit ahead of where the online students are. So it gives me a chance to run through, try things, and then adapt it to the digital design online. I would love to say that in the future they would be really similar, but now that I'm a little bit more into this, I'm realizing that I think it's always going to be a little bit different. And that's the little hopeful part of me that it wouldn't be so much work. But I'm finding that there is a, a reasonable amount of time to take something that I am doing in a regular class and switching it on over. So digital design. The software that I chose to use, and this is the meat of why we're here, is to talk about Haiku. I did a lot of research for what I wanted to do. and. I had a little previous knowledge about what other people were using. I know Port Huron uses Moodle a lot. I've used Weebly a lot. I think I've used Weebly for the past five or six years, I think since it came out. And I really wanted to stick with Weebly, but since I've used it in the past, I realized that I was running into the problem with how much content I was trying to get across to the students. And it really ends up into a scroll fest. And by that I mean I put the information on there and by the time we get to the end of the semester, the kids are scrolling to the bottom of the page and they're really searching all over for the information. So I wanted to do more of 
a learning management focus, something that already has a lot of what I want baked into it. And that's what led me to Haiku. It is a lot like Weebly in that you're drop and drag, you're pulling the elements that you want to put together to make your site but the things that you would want for your classroom are already there. So it already had discussion forms built in. It has statistics built in so I can track what students are doing on there. It is really awesome and appeals to the art side of me and that I can set up the interface, which was one of my real negatives about Moodle and sort of Edmodo too is that you can't really control the flow of how a student approaches your site. I want to be able to decide what they see first. What do they go to first? What impression do they get? I think it makes a bigger impact than we realize when we're funneling them all the way through something like Moodle, which is very structured. And I know you can put themes in there and you can change it up a bit, but what Haiku does is give you the opportunity to move blocks around and you can do that for every single page and have every page be exactly the way you want it with a big text, you can stretch it all the way across, you can make it short. That is really handy when you're really trying to guide them. You're not there to say, look at this first or stop here first. So I really wanted that focus and I mentioned customizable for a lot of reasons, but specifically being able to organize what they see and when they see it. I really wanted to bring your attention to something called TPAC, and some of you may have already heard or seen that before, but it's deciding that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Just because we have all this technology available doesn't mean everything should be canned into that. So all the decisions I made about selecting Haiku, I was really thinking about my content knowledge. What do I need to get across to them? Can I do it this way? Is the technology there? How am I pulling the technology in so it's useful? Just because the kids all could have iPads, does it really mean that that's a good use for what I want to do? So I'm always thinking technology, my teaching strategies, how does Haiku help me keep the rigor keep them enthused about the site. So I always keep that in mind because it's so easy to get excited about something and think, wow, this is great, but really, is it a good choice? So as I was looking at Haiku, I was checking all of these things out to make sure that they're in there. They were, they were on my most wanted list. They're not all there, and I think that's the dilemma we all face when we're picking out a learning management system. Does it have you know, the best choice of on there, of what you want on there? So free, I know that you know as public school, we don't always have the big options. Blackboard is hugely expensive, so that isn't you know, something that we're probably going to be considering in this. We're going to be focusing more on things that are in the cloud, like Google, like Haiku, like Weebly. These are all really easy for us to have access to. I wanted to make sure it was something that students could access, especially if we could find a way for them to be able to do that on their cell phones. They're going to be there anyway, so it makes sense to get them to use it for what we want them to use it for. I always compare it to having something like a poster. If I put a poster up in the school and it's down around the corner of a hall and I send all the kids down there to look at it, some are gonna go and look at that poster. But if I have that poster right on their locker, somewhere where they already are, they're gonna look at it a lot more. And that's what I feel about when I use Facebook or Twitter or any of these other things to pull into Haiku. They're already using these options, and so we're just repurposing them for an educational outlet. I'm trying to remind myself, 10 minutes. Engagement. I do a lot of custom tutorials for my students to make sure that they're getting all the information. They're getting regular, consistent feedback from me. I really plan out how the site looks, what they're looking at, what they're getting a chance to see. And even though it's an online class, I'm really working hard to still build community because I think that they get into the thought that 
it is self-directed and they're at their own pace and they automatically assume that that means they're just going it alone. You know, that they're put in there and you just say, okay, go, go do this stuff. Read this, click this, you're done. And I really worked hard to make sure that there are discussion forums, that we work as a group, that they're providing feedback for each other's work. Since it is an art class, they're posting their work on the site and they're still getting that communication and that opportunity for collaboration on multiple levels. It isn't just a random project, it's something every week where they're responsible to the other people in the class and to me by giving feedback. I really hope that, you know, out of all the things we leave here from and after you see all these presentations, you keep in mind that we shouldn't just abandon them online and go with the stereotype of all these kids these days, they know all this stuff. You know, they know the internet, they're on Facebook, they know this. Well, a lot of times they don't. You know, if you think about what we make them do to drive, they're around cars all the time, but we don't just assume they know how to do all that. And I don't think we should just assume that they know how to do all this technology that we're asking them to do. The strengths I felt, you know, we were asked about the student perspective and the teacher perspective, and I really thought they were a lot alike for both of us. Anywhere, anytime, any pace for online learning, of course that's a huge strength. Student-centered, making sure that they have the information all there in a package deal, and accessibility, meaning they have the power of the internet there, it's all there. You have it in a package and you're handing them this great class almost like a TV dinner, you know? All your stuff is there, it's fixed, it's ready to go. There are a lot of challenges. Um, I've already mentioned a few of these things. I mentioned computer literacy and I, mentioned the difficulty for us to get our students this information, meaning do they have the software on their laptops? But I, I want to mention essential online qualities. I think they're the same for both the teacher and the student. You know, I think in our building we spent a lot of time not scaring the students, but really getting them to understand that they need to be self-directed, they need to be able to get in there and understand that even though I will have t t tutorials and I will explain what we're doing, they still have a lot of reading to do, probably more than they're expecting. And assessing themselves and saying, okay, I can do that. I have the patience to sit here and listen to this and read through this is the same for the teacher. Getting all the information ready and prepping it, making sure that you're a teacher who's willing to spend time daily online, on your website, checking for their information, checking to see whether they have questions, is an important one to ask of yourself as you charge into something like this. Are you gonna to wanna to do that? Are you gonna to wanna to be on your phone just scrolling to see if anybody sent you anything? Because when they're there, they're there whenever they wanna be. And that means you're there all the time in case they're there. And knowing that about yourself could save you a lot of headaches later on. The last one on here, this is the one I thought, oh, whew, this one's gonna be tough. Lack of understanding from administration, faculty and students. I think I'm still finding out, and it's surprising me, that a lot of people, I would say the majority of people, don't understand what an online class is. They don't understand the time that's involved or the potential benefits. Instead of just saying, oh, we should do this, we should put this online, I really think it's important to understand that it's gonna be good for some students and not all, and to have options there and think about what classes are gonna work better this way and think about what staff you have preparing this so that they're not you know, killing hopes and dreams by having something really dry, really boring, not very engaging for students to go to, and then that sets them up with the thought, well, you know, this isn't very interesting, why would I wanna do this? So I think a big part of what we need to do as we get into this more is advertise and explain what it is. 
I plan to do a lot more in the future with video, talking to the counselors in the building and explaining what my class looks like, what we do in there, because it really is a mystery to them. The biggest eye-opener were some parents that came in during conferences and they said, you know, I saw my son and he was on the computer and he was making a bunch of lines and circles and stuff. What's that about? It's like, huh. That's the online class. That's what he's supposed to be doing. But they really didn't understand that at all. And I realized that was a big gap that I didn't know I had until I started hearing back from some people. So more advertising on my part. I mentioned time, an unexpected amount of time. As we wrap this up, throughout all of this, I've kind of hit on some of this. I can't emphasize the time enough. I know that as I get more sophisticated at what I'm doing, it will shrink the amount of time I need. But I think that people need to go into, students and staff need to go into it thinking about the amount of time it's going to take to be there for the students because we're used to that installment of having them in class and how much more it's going to take. I mentioned about reflection as in giving more a shout out to the program so that people know what it is. And one of the things for me and my subject matter for digital design is that it is very technical and it's easy for the students to get lost in that. And I've used other tutorials that people have made, but I found that they're not specific enough for me. And I liked it because it saved me a little bit of time, but I think that it was a misconception because now I'm backtracking, trying to fill in the gaps. So a reflection for me is that I would definitely like to do more of my own tutorial, more of my own setup for my classes. Lastly, my plans for what's next. I'm always looking for the next challenge, what I'm going to do for my class, for websites, whatever it might be technology-wise. Adding and refreshing my personal learning network. I always try to stay up on things that are coming up, and I set reminders on my phone. I take classes when I can, because I do want to keep it engaging for the students. I don't want to just say, gee, I learned how to do this new way to present, and then leave it at that and have that only be the new learning. And down here at the bottom, as I've gone through this and researched more, two learning management systems that I would love to learn more about are Canvas and Open Class. Open Class is sponsored by Google, which I think makes it very appealing for us since a lot of us already have that access in our buildings. And because it comes back with all the awesome things that Google already has. So I'm looking into that. And I'm looking into Canvas. It is a lot like Haiku. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the same customization that you can put into it. But those are the two that I'm going to be looking forward to learning more about and possibly using. It's going to be hard to give up Haiku just because it is so easy to set up. I can hop in there and get the stuff done right away. But I have had to put some extra plugins into it, meaning chat and discussion, those extra platforms that I'd like the students to have that aren't in Haiku. So this is that slide I said would be at the end because I was rushing to get everything out my email and as i said everything that i have for you is on this website online learning this presentation so that you could stop it because i know it clicked through some things very fast before you could really look at them all of the images that were in here are on that website also please don't hesitate if you really wanted to know more about something i would love to tell you and love to be able to do it and not have to rush through in 10 minutes so follow that Thank you for the opportunity to share all this with you. I'm a math and physics teacher at Memphis High School. And I have a website with online materials for all the subjects that I teach. I put my schedule on the handout. When you see the classes in parentheses, 
that means that I'm teaching both of those at the same time. Those kids are using the online resources, and the ones that are not in parentheses are actually with me live in class. Okay, so I'm switching back and forth. And I started out with the Teaching Tools for Digital Natives workshop, and that kind of opened my ideas, you know, my ideas up in this area, because before that, I knew a lot about math and physics, but the potential of technology, sometimes I don't see it. You know, so by going to the workshop, I got ideas of what is possible to do. And as far as being engaging in class, I sometimes have songs or dances or games, videos, field trips, but none of that is in my online tools. So I was just gonna show you what I have on my website. Every teacher in Memphis has a Google site. So if you ever wanna go there, just go to Memphis. K12.org. Teacher websites. Put myself down there at the bottom. And I have contact information if people want to look at my schedule or contact me. As you can see over here, I have every chapter of everything I teach. The AP Calculus AB and the Pre-Calculus I see every other day. I see Pre-Calculus on Monday wherein I give them all their instruction for the week. Wednesday I answer homework questions and then Friday both classes come for a quiz. And the Calculus class comes Tuesday and Thursday and they're there Friday for the quiz also. Now I found that just having instructional videos for kids doesn't mean they're watching them. <laughs> you know, I could show you what I have in there, for example. In calculus, I, I had already created a PowerPoint, but that's what I did. I switched formats from YouTube, where there are all those advertisements and distractions for kids, over to everything being in Google Drive. So when they go to watch the video, all they see is the video. They don't see things luring them away on the side. Uh, on my handout, I put my website down at the bottom. Oh, I have all kinds of different stuff, too, even though apparently I can't show it. <laughs> down in Algebra 2, I started out the year, and in physics also, I would just use my iPad to take a picture of the notes, and then later I'd narrate them and maybe write some things on there. But later I figured out how to use Reflector and, and my dosary and stuff that's connected to the computer so that I could explain things to them if they have a homework question for example I can write and they can see me writing and I talk and it's recording at the same time but they have to be silent in class for me to be able to do that and they, they do pretty much I had somebody showed out this is hard last week during a problem but you know <laughs> that being immortalized is okay <laughs> and the pre calc class they have it starts out with just pictures of the notes that are narrated and then if they're absent they like that because they can watch it at home also, we have computers available for the kids that are in the off section, you know, the ones that are not with me, so they can always work on the computer. Hmm. I'm thrown off by not being able to go in there. Talk a little bit about maybe on, um, you know, how do you use this platform to engage your students since you're not seeing them all the I don't do much to engage them. Math and physics are engaging on their own. <laughs> no, they're pretty much simple instructional presentations that I have online. I'm going to try to work on getting more kid-made presentations that I hope will be more engaging for kids to watch in the future. Last year, I was just trying to keep ahead of the class because I was asked to teach the online section of the AP Calculus class. And I wanted to be sure everything was there for them, so I just did the essentials last year. I have ex explanations of the material, and then all the homework worked out. And I might have a song or two, but that's about it. Um, okay, what else would you like to hear about? Um, why did you pick Google? Well, we decided to be a Google school. That wasn't something I decided, but as a district, we decided to be a Google school. And so since everybody has a Google site, I have a Google site. And 
Also, like I said, some of the th things like Moodle, the students don't like it. It's kind of user unfriendly, I think, where this is very similar to what they're used to using. I used to have Facebook pages for every class where I would post their homework every day because kids like to go on Facebook. But I discovered that they weren't really using it that much. And I had a Twitter feed on my website so I could send announcements. But they didn't sign up. And it was finally this year I figured out why. They think that I'm going to follow them. And they don't want me watching that, but I'm not that interested in it. So I, sw <laughs> I switched over to Remind 101. That takes their phone number, but I don't get their phone number. And it texts them when I have announcements. And there, that is on my home page. I don't know if we can see that in here. Yeah, there's an announcement right here about getting extra credit. So there's a feed of announcements coming in there. Um, what the kids had to say, I sent out a survey to see what they think of the online. They like it, that it's available anytime. And even though it's not super engaging, they like it that when they're home or on a computer, they can rewind because some of the things that I'm explaining are pretty hard. So they can go back and listen to it again. They really like it in pre-calc that I put up a practice quiz every week so they know what to expect on their quiz. Now they want that in every class. But it takes me time to make all this stuff. <laughs> They, what, what did they say? Oh, they, they would like it if I would make a discussion format. And I asked them what they envision there. What they envision is that I will be available 24-7 on my cell phone to answer their math questions. So we haven't done that yet. <laughs> uh, what else did they say they disliked? I think most of them just like, like having the online things available. It gives us a lot of scheduling flexibility in our school. And the main challenge, as was mentioned before, is the time commitment. I, I would say last year, I was there an hour early. I worked through my lunch and my prep hour every day. And I was putting in five to six hours a night making these things. So that's a lot of time. Some of both. Okay, like in pre-calculus, they come in and I do explain everything to them fresh every week on Monday. They get a week's worth of material. But I have the notes from last year up there. So if there's something that's unclear, I have example problems and I have notes, then they can go back on the days they're not with me if they need some help. Um, those notes were not made live with the students for the most part. I did them on my own. You know, so I could conduct class like usual. The calculus class, they have PowerPoints, which are presented in my live class. But I also made them online so that the kids that you see, whenever they're in parentheses, they're stuck watching videos. See, the calculus class, I would say three days a week, the online calculus kids are dependent strictly on the videos. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Do you have given time in class to watch them? Or do you, are no, they never have time in class to watch them. Right. On Thursdays, when I do not have the pre-calc students, I get them the iPads from our school so they can watch the practice quiz to be prepared for their quiz on Friday. But that's the only time. But they're not with me. Any kids with me, I'm answering live questions, going around and helping. Unless they've been absent, I might let them use headphones on a computer in the back of the room. Well, that's one of my challenges, too. See, we have a couple extra rooms right now. So they're in a room across the hall from me. So I've had some behavior management issues, you know, where I'd see them taking off down to the office or something without permission. So I've had to work on that. Sometimes it sounds like there's a riot going on over across the hall. You know, so I'm trying to work with them on that. You know, since it. Well, they're allowed to stay home, but they don't choose to. They choose to come to school. So most of them are across the hall in a class, and I supervise both classrooms. But since they're upper-level classes, for the most part, they're pretty responsible, well-behaved kids. Do you have four props? Do you have, are all four? Right? Do you have four different courses you teach? Yes. And all four are here? Yes. 
but some of the classes have more than others. Like Algebra 2 and Physics, since they see me live every day, I haven't developed as much depth of information for them. But as, as they ask me for something, I make it. Like if they want a couple more homework examples, I'll do that. Wait, what was I answering? Is there something you wish you would have known? Oh, yeah. If I play you one of the homework videos from the beginning of the year, the writing is really small because when I would zoom in on the iPad, I thought it was zooming in on the view they would see, and that isn't true. So for part of the year, they have real small writing, but they say it works out okay for them. They said I'm explaining it well enough that they still pick it up. But I wish I knew to you know, take the picture of a smaller amount of stuff so it would be bigger. I think I listed a couple other things I wish I knew. Well, like I wish I knew not to use YouTube right from the start. I, I wish I knew what my other options were. It still is a challenge for me to balance all those different papers and stuff coming in from all the different subjects. Because just personally, I think that people who think they can give kids online tests that they can take over and over are kidding themselves. You know, so I make a certain amount of stuff that I look at myself. I think it's, I get pretty swamped with stuff sometimes. Okay, so this is an example of the relationship between the graphs of F and F prime. Also, we're going to have a game, and there's also going to be a graph of F double prime, which would just be the derivative of the derivative. So let's look at these two graphs. Okay, over here you can see it says y, and that's the function. And over here it says y prime. Oh, you can't see that anymore. Um, you can see that this is y prime because that is the derivative function. So the x-axis didn't change, but what you do is you look over at your original function and you see, okay, here the slope of this curve would be zero. Where is that? I don't know, it's at two. So you come over to two on this graph plot a zero. Where else does it look like the slope might be zero on my graph? I find it... Okay, so that's an example of one of the calculus lectures that I have. So you can see how small well, the writing is. Look solutions for um, your first section of derivatives. Like I've been explaining to you, though, please try to figure them out yourself and then pause the video whenever possible. You know, don't rely on my solutions to learn this stuff. So. Okay, so first I have the exercise. So there's an example here. of homework help. From one, one through six and twelve, I think it was. So they did. Okay, and then I was going to show you pre calc one. So this well, is today we're going to talk about types of mathematical models. So that's an example of where I would just take a picture of my whiteboard and then narrate. Did you say your kids are self-paced? No. Okay. No, I keep after them all the time. Because you probably know we have benchmarks they're supposed to learn in the course of a year. And if I don't structure it for most people, I think it's too challenging for them. You know, so I, it, you know, I do try to modify based on ability to some extent by helping people, but I feel like I have to keep them a structure set up where, where they're heading for trouble. They could self-pace. Like, I've had a student study Algebra 2 over the summer on her own before I had this, 
and so she could get ahead a year in math, but I haven't had anybody do that yet. They do have to have a book. They have to have a textbook to go with my materials that's based on the books that we've been using for the courses. Anything else you'd want to see or any other questions? Okay, I'm Tiffany McLaughlin, and I teach English 12 um, blended at Marysville High School. My kids are in the building two times a week. They're there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they stay at home. They get that extra hour, kind of like flex time on their own to either do their homework or, as many of my kids do, sleep in um, as late as possible and then come in with an extra hour of sleep. Um, I've been teaching English at Marysville for the last three years. This is my fourth year. I also taught a little bit as a permanent sub at Memphis and at the ATA. Um, this picture is actually my blended English 12 front. Um, I use Moodle, and I chose Moodle because I went through a um, blended learning in the classroom course, and it was run by Remsey. And it was really, really beneficial to me. That's why I got so excited about blended learning. And it actually worked on Moodle. Took us through all of the same kind of stuff that we could take our kids through. Um, it was perhaps the most beneficial class that I have ever taken in my teaching career. And I had just finished my master's, unfortunately. So um, it was, I mean, it was amazing. I loved it. It was wonderful and I was, just so engaged by this material that I wanted to present the same thing to my kids. Um, if you would like, I'm on the Marysville Moodle site, and it is under Mrs. McLaughlin's Blended English 12, and the guest login is parent. There is a direct link from the Marysville site, or if you would like, I can send you my presentation at the end. If you give me your email, I can um, share you to this immediately. Um, please, if you are interested, log in or have your teachers log in. I'm open to sharing. I'm very, very excited about the whole blended learning idea, obviously. Um, so if they are interested in it, please have them log in snoop around a little bit. I've had a couple of teachers just do that and you know if it sparks an idea in them then rock on. It's great. Um, the reason that I chose Moodle is because I was kind of familiar with it. So I had worked with it at the ATA and then I worked again with it on the Blick course. To me it wasn't as unfriendly as it has been posed and mainly by outside sources, too. I've heard how Moodle, you know, the kids don't like it, and it's very hard to maneuver. Once you get into it, it's well worth the kind of learning curve at first. There are a ton of options. Anything from testing to discussion forums to grading online are all available in Moodle, and that's why I liked it, especially for a blended class where the kids won't be in school part of the time. You can put pretty much anything you want onto Moodle, and it's there, it's ready for the kids. I also like the fact that you could pace the students. You can open up things once they complete something, then they move on to the next thing. Once they complete that, then they move on to the next thing. And you can set those kind of permissions on Moodle, which is awesome because I know some of my kids would just go in and cherry pick this looks great, I want to do this, and then this. With English, it's very important that you structure it in a way that they get certain information first, and then they move on to the next information, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we take part in Moodle at Marysville, so it was easy for me to get a course. It's easy for me to get six different courses if I wanted. So um, it was very, very easy for me as a teacher. Um, I just really like the fact that this was a really rich platform for me. The yay part of this is that, and much as the other teacher said, for the kids and for me, it's kind of the same thing. 
Um, it's a different schedule for me. In the mornings, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I don't have a first hour. My prep is second hour. For the first two, two hours of the day, I get a ton of stuff done. A ton. The kids love that they can sleep in. Granted, it's obviously the most basic thing that you know they could like about it, but if they enjoy that, that's great. I mean, if they enjoy a little bit more about the English class, then I'm happy. I can work on it from anywhere and soak in day. In fact, all summer, I worked on this. And I could do it, you know, in my pajamas in my kitchen looking out at my pool. So that was great for me. You know, at home, I can sit down with the dogs, have them around me, and work on it from my computer. I don't have to go into the school, which I do occasionally, but it's really nice to be able to sit at home in my sweats and just cuddle up with the puppies. <laughs> I mean, that's really nice. I don't get the same assignment from two students at all. They're pretty creative. And it's surprising when you say, these are the, um, the requirements that I want you to fulfill. These are the things I want you to hit. Whatever you do is up to you. It's amazing what you will get from some of these kids creative stuff, and I have a few examples, actually, that I'm going to show to you. The kids are surprisingly engaged, say that they love the freedom. I've gotten really positive feedback from them. Um, quite a few students, man, Mrs. McLaughlin, I really like this. I like that I can work on it whenever. I like that I can pace it. When I have time, I do it. When I don't have time, I don't do it. And that's kind of the selling point for me. Creativity, and you can work on it whenever. It's up to you. You decide. It's a more open and fluid classroom where I'm constantly changing. So occasionally we have slip ups, especially since this is the first year. There's been days that they've come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and I've been like, okay, we're gonna do this in class today. And they're like, all right, sounds good. Although not quite that energetic because it is 8 a.m. and some of them have gotten used to sleeping in. Okay, Mrs. McLaughlin, whatever you say. And I go, go to this spot. And they go to it and they look at me and go, yeah, and I can't click on it. I can't get to it. I don't know what you want me to do. So it's a constant, OK, let's brainstorm. It's made me think more on my feet. And it's made me be open to the possibilities of just changing things up, which is good as a teacher. I mean, being able to change things up is really key, especially in English. Now, on the flip side, this year it is a lot of work. And I've actually talked to other teachers about this. I don't have kids. I have two dogs. Those are the closest things that I have to kids. And my husband. Um, and I mean, all summer I worked on this. Probably 100 hours trying to create this um, classroom where it, they would be visually and um, just engaged in every way that they possibly could be. So it was a lot of work. However, I did have all summer to work on it. I mean. I'm a teacher. I get the summer off. So I get bored after like a week or two of doing nothing. It kept me busy, at least. Um, there are minor meltdowns, both for me and for the kids. The first week was the closest to a nightmare that I, can, I could possibly experience. Mrs. McLaughlin, and almost in tears, I don't know how to do this. Well, you're not going to. You're really not going to, because you haven't been exposed to this before. But next year, when you're in college, as a lot of these kids are, you're going to have these minor meltdowns, and you're not going to have someone right next to you saying, OK, here's how you're going to walk through it. Okay, So it's kind of like a stepping stone into that college experience where they're going to have to go to their professor or be self-directed or decide that, yes, I have enough time, and even though it's Friday afternoon, I have to do it anyway. Darn. Um, it is much different than any other class. I have to deal with my kids differently. I have to have almost more contact with them because they are unfamiliar with it. There's a lot, an awful, awful lot of interaction between me and the kids. And it's interesting, but there's an awful lot of, OK, hold on. When you email me at 9 o'clock on a Sunday night, you got to hold on, stop panicking, because I've had a lot of those. I don't know what to do, and you can just see them like getting red in the face virtually. So it's very, very different. Um, and 
you also have to be able to check in with the course frequently. Like Teresa said, it's a constant thing. There are some things that I am constantly changing. I'm constantly on. And it's okay for me because I have enough time. But again, it's a time commitment. And I'm sure next year it'll be much different. It'll be much easier. easier. But this year, it's very, very hectic. So I enjoy it. I like the crazy and the chaos. But it's a personality thing. I kind of like it. Um, there are some examples. I had them for Animal Farm do a dictator's portfolio. So they had to create a portfolio online in digital format, and I said, you have to have these things in red. A video clip, a resume, two examples of things that you've done that demonstrate the qualities of work you are capable of, a letter of recommendation, and it has to be creative. Those are the kinds of things that I give to the kids. And then I say, here are some of the options that you can take. But if you find another one, if you find one that you think is really cool, run with it. Do that. So I give them all kinds of stuff. I give them Weebly's an option, um, creating a website through some other platform, creating a video, um, sending it to me through Google Docs in some way, shape, or form. This is what I get from my students. I get websites, Weebly, and they send me videos, and it's, there's all kinds of stuff that they do that's very, very cool. I got a portfolio for Snowball, right? So all kinds of little pig pictures and the resume and very sarcastic um, kinds of letters of recommendation. Um, it's just a lot of creativity from kids who generally say, what's the least amount of work that I can do? And how do I do that in the least amount of time? If it takes me five minutes instead of 20, great. But these kids are, they're giving me more than I ask even. I also did a PSA. If you're interested in that, I can send you again, send you the um, link won't bore you with lots of other stuff. Um, in short, I mean, I completely love it. I really do. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of kind of emotional engagement in something that is inanimate and, you know, online. So the kids like it. I like it. I really enjoy it. Do you have any questions for me? Go ahead. We actually talked about it. Bill and I talked about it quite a bit. Um, we didn't want to. We didn't want to get only the superstars. You know those kids, the ones that give me stuff like this. Um, we wanted to open it to a variety of kids, and we did. We took. I took all of the kids that I thought were capable of doing this. Um, there are a few students that still struggle with it. I'm not going to lie. There are a lot of students who some days they're like, I can't do this. I don't know. And they need my help. But that's the thing. I give them an awful, awful, awful lot of help. So they're struggling through it. But then again, these students are going to college next year. So they're going to need that self-direction. If they need a little help from me right now, it's better than I, that I do it with them right now rather than totally bombing in college. And that's my, my viewpoint on it. Yes. Yeah, I met several times with them, too. Thank you, Bill. Um, I met several times with them, too, and said, OK, here is a couple of different things that I've looked up, gives you an idea of what blended learning is, who would be good for it. I had them take a test as well, um, just to see, you know, are you self-directed enough? Can you do this on your own? Are you, you know, are you confident in the fact that you can accomplish this? So we did an awful lot of meeting as well. All right.
Okay, my name is uh, Damian Pappen. I'm from Crosby Lexington High School. Uh, I've been teaching. I'm a general science major um, and a math minor. I've been teaching math for about the last nine or ten years uh, solely. And uh, last year we had a discussion when we were going to iPads. Actually, two years ago we had a discussion about was it possible, because I primarily teach, I actually almost teach exclusively freshmen or anyone who struggles. So uh, freshmen in the math class is always an interesting treat. Some people don't like it. I really love them. They're a lot of fun. Uh, they present their own challenges, but they're, they're great young students. And we try and get them to where they need to be. So we said to the math department, do you think we could have an online class? And pretty much the consensus was that's really not a great idea two years ago, especially with freshmen because we know how freshmen are. And uh, freshmen are not very organized when they come over from the middle school. Some of them, it's a big change for them. It's the grades now really count. You have to pass these state mandated classes. And um, so we had those struggles. So what we planned out was we took and we said, you know, let's see, we're on trimesters. We said for the first trimester, let's see these students and take a look at them. And I see the majority of them. And we said, let's identify students we think which was talked about previously, who we think could make it through this class. They may not be an A student, but we think they have the skill set that we could introduce them into a situation where they um, are, excuse me, uh, they are able to uh, self-pace a little bit and come into a blended learning type of situation. And so that worked out real well. We started with about 28 students. Our platform was iTunes U, and the reason for that is we took a look at Zealand before we introduced the iPads. And so we were very fortunate that we were allowed to kind of use our own creativity as teachers, use multiple platforms, and teachers are doing great things at our school with all of those various platforms. The reason I chose the iTunes U platform, which I'm going to show you, is that it allows you to build a course and to actually download it and take it with you. So one of the things we have logistically in our area is not everyone has high-speed internet. So you're talking about a population that about half of them don't have high-speed internet. They don't have access to it. And so here you have this online class and they're going, I can't do the work unless I'm at school. iTunes U allows you the ability to bring that information and pack it and take it with you without having the internet. So if they're at school and they know they don't have that course information, they can download it and take it with them and then they can access it anywhere they want. Um, so I'm going to just take a moment. I'm going to give access to anyone who did uh, put the tiny URL in. I use a, t a tiny URL there uh, because iTunes U has massive, long URLs that they, they give you for students. So it's definitely beneficial to go over there. Um, What you're seeing right there, uh, and I'll back up in a second, is I'm able to allow my students to request access to the course, and then I can grant it or remove it as we need to. So that's one of the things that happens. And I'm going to just slide back into this other slide here. And so what you would see sim somewhat like my course is uh, what you have here. This is from the teacher side of this. I'm going to apologize because I can't, I'm not going to be able to go back and forth right away, but I will go into it. But anyways, when we decided on the iTunes U, part of the, the thing that's very nice, it's very organized. So for freshmen, it's very helpful. You have to create an outline. You tie your topics to that outline. So it's very structured for students who are not very successful at being structured. And they're actually able to look up the content by an actual topic, just like you would in a book. All the materials you attach to it are tied to it, so they don't have to click over here and click over there and go over here. They can grab all of that information at the same time. And that's one of the probably the biggest advantages is that all of the information for the whole course is contained within there. So when a student is taking a look at that information, they have everything they need, not, oh, you forgot to give me this, or you forgot to give me that, or I couldn't find it. They can just go right to the materials, and it's there. If you want to look at it based on the, the post, um, which I'll have to show through the student interface, it actually ties it to their actual outline. 
So we went through that uh, a year ago, and I did a blended class. We met Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and what we would do is I would send them the whole week's worth of information. They would go through it. I create their videos on uh, Screencast-O-Matic, and I use a Hitachi tablet, which is kind of like a smart board, only I can stand right here and I can direct and talk. There's actually no visual screen here, but it annotates everything that I want up there. I can capture images and send it to that. I'll play one of those videos here when I change over. If you had a chance to log in, uh, which it didn't look like too many people did log in, I'll show you kind of what we do. And so what happens is I send them the information, they come into my class, and then we do some things that are more critical, like I say, you were supposed to have re reviewed this material, and we'll have some problems on the board that we're going to talk about, and I'll tell them to pair up, and I'll say, pick something that you know something about, and we'll go over there and we'll work on those types of problems. And then we'll take it a step further, and we'll use a program like Pick Collage, which um, is not accessible by iTunes U, so I'm going to have to jump around. I'm sorry if I'm jumping around a little bit. And they'll send me, email me, a uh, digital format of what they're doing to address those problems. They can use written text. They can use images to show that. Uh, sometimes we use Show Me or Nearpod and have students give presentations in that form. The downfall, and I apologize, I'm going to jump out of order, is that you can't do dialogue two ways on iTunes U. It's made to be a pack and go for them. They're going to have to email to you. So I know a lot of people actually pair this with um, Edmodo because you can do your assessments there and they, they tie that together. But as far as a course is concerned, it's very neat and tidy and user friendly and intuitive to the students. Uh, I'm going to switch over just to show this so hopefully this works out well. Okay. Um, okay, so what, it, what students going to see is that they're going to have uh, some, a particular course they're enrolled in. And right now, the, the course I was showing to the class here was our Algebra 1 trimester A. And so if we open that up, what they're going to see is the posts. They're chronologically from most current to the oldest. I can build the posts so that they don't show, and I send them out as I want, so I can control the pace at which the students see it. And what you would see there is something like where um, solving inequalities and graphing, uh, that's something created on Screencast-O-Matic. Um, so we would have a video here if it plays this. And I, I'm doing this on uh, the, a tablet, and I'm recording it on my machine at the same time. I'm downloading it to my machine, then uploading it to iTunes U. The nice thing about the iTunes U is they give you 20 gigs in the cloud, so there's probably the largest amount of information anyone stores for free. And it stores everything there. It doesn't matter if it's PDF, Word, open sources. It uses all of that. Um, if I were to pause that, which on my screen is not showing here, and it allows you to tie in web links. I heard a lot of people say that they wish they didn't use um, something like uh, YouTube. I use something called Virtual Nerd. So here's actually a web link for Virtual Nerd, uh, which does a lot of nice things for mathematics. And so you can push play in here, and the kids can watch that. I have the ability to either send this as a link or send it as a video. Now the big difference there is that it built within this course, built within the course, if I want to take a video that I've created, and I want to take notes on it, Hopefully it's going to come up here in a second on this screen. I apologize, there's a little, little difference in the format. Um, what you should see is there's a screen actually underneath on like my iPad here. So as they're watching the notes built into my iTunes U course, they can write down notes that they're taking about the videos that I've created. And so they're able to keep that contained within there as well and it's tied to that actual video. So when they want to go back and they want to review for a quiz or a test or something of that nature, they can go back and hit my notes and go into that. Um, I'm sorry this doesn't do justice between the two here, so if you get a chance to log in, uh, please do that. Um, the biggest thing that's a challenge is, like I said, the communication. 
the communication between iTunes U is one way. However, it is nice because I build it for each class individually. So I tailor it to each class. So I say, hey, make sure you guys are studying this. Or remember, we were struggling with that. And I just shoot it out to them. And it sends it as a post. And they're able to take a look at that. And it gives them a reminder. Instead of me having to put 30 emails in and send that group out all the time, I just send it right through their post, the things I know that we're trying to differentiate and send that to them. Uh, last year went really successful for us. We had everyone pass out of the blended learning class. A lot of students liked it. I actually started out using other websites' videos, and my students all griped it at me and said, why aren't you taping them and doing that? So then I kind of moved into Screencast-O-Matic and uh, got onto that bandwagon a little bit, which has been very nice. It's very user-friendly. There's a free source out there. You can record about 15 minutes with Screencast-O-Matic. It's super user-friendly. allows you to post to YouTube. You can post to your own digital files. And the biggest thing that's awesome about iTunes U is it just works with everything. It doesn't matter what format you're using. If you can save it on your machine, you can upload it, and it will present through their platform. I have not had anything. And we probably have eight or nine teachers now that have kind of joined in that have said, this is what I, where I want to go, and it really does work well. The new things that they've actually added to iTunes U is I can send a course to anyone, anywhere. So if I build a course, I can send it to you, and you now have that course. If I want to have collaboration between here and Arizona and develop some math course, I can send it and ask you to be a collaborator with me, and we can work on it at the same time and make additions and change that course. So that's probably one of the biggest ahas that you could have about this course is it allows that collaboration where a lot of times when you're doing a website and that type of thing it's very specific and individual to the person where if you're trying to create maybe content for your school um, you're going to be much more successful at having your whole department contribute we have four people who teach algebra so it's nice for us all to add our concepts into a class same questions on that It's just going to leave the other screen up there, but if not, uh, it's just dpeppin at croslex.org if you ever want to get set up. I've set up quite a few people from Prime. I'm here for Prime normally, so uh, I have talked to a lot of people in the mass, so I'm usually here. I've helped a few other people get started with iTunes U, um, but I'm glad to help if that's something you're interested in just even taking a look at. It's kind of a cool thing. Some people use it just for their videos. They house it just for videos so they can pack them and send them with kids for some of the challenges we have to deal with. Thank you very much.